Good morning. My name is Rich Wolf. I'm one of the pastors here at Village 7. I work with adult ministries. So if you have any questions, I'd love to visit with you and get to know you a little bit better, especially if you're visiting. We'd love to get to know you and uh, meet you out there in the lobby and the Welcome Center. I'll be out there after the service, and there'll be others out there as well just to meet you and to get to know you. So uh, please come by and visit. Uh, we'd like to get to uh, hear some of your story. Uh, next week, next Saturday, we have City Serve. And City Serve is a great opportunity for churches and individuals from around the city to serve our city. And there's a variety of ways in which you can do that. You can sign up, uh, you can lead a group. Uh, I have a group that's going to Jenkins Middle uh, Elementary School. I have a few slots open, so if you're interested in going, see me at the Welcome Center. I'll sign you up, and you can be a part of my group as well. But it's a great opportunity for us just to love our city uh, in a very practical and tangible way. So I'd encourage you, if your Saturday morning is open, to uh, really consider how you can do that. So right now we're going to be hearing a little bit more about the uh, women's ministry uh, coming up, a conference made for more. And Marty Nelson, come on up. Am I on? Um, you know, I have been struck by what women, our women and our little women, have been fed in our culture. And it's things like you are enough and you can have it all and you can have it all now. And you need to just speak your truth, and you need to um, come up with your own truth, and you do you. And the sad thing is that I found that these lies are so close to the truth that even the church begins to believe it. Um, when I look at this, and I see this permeating our culture, and women are told that they are enough, and yet more than ever, I see that there's more depression, and there's more anxiety, and there's more feeling of not enoughness than ever before. And as I hear these loud voices in our ear, in our culture, I see our good, good father pull us close and whisper in our ear and say, daughter, you were made for more. And I love that, and I love that we have the opportunity on October 18th and 19th to gather together for a conference that I believe will be culture changing. I hope that you will join me and my daughter and my daughter-in-law and my granddaughters as we come for a time of fun and fellowship and a time of food and creativity, but mostly a time of teaching, biblical teaching, about creation design, about gospel identity, and one of my favorites, about intergenerational friendships. Our, our um, registration closes on Tuesday, so please take advantage of the opportunity to be part of this culture-changing opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. Also, you know, we have opportunities to serve outside the church. We also have opportunities to serve within the church. And so when you came in, you received one of these. And so there's uh, two um, aspects to this. On one side is serving opportunities. And you can see the list there. And so just kind of look it over. Uh, and if you are interested in serving in one of these different areas, uh, we'll be collecting these uh, both, I think, in the offer offering. And also at the end, you can drop it off. Um, as well. But on the other side are also ways for you to get more information about what's going on in the church. And this is to sign up for a variety of different uh, emails uh, that go out so that you can be in the know and you can be aware of what's going on. So do take a time and um, look those over as you can. Uh, last week we had the re-election of elders and deacons and uh, thank you for those who stayed and voting on those, and they were reelected. Uh, one of the things I thought about was, let's make sure that we pray for our elders and our deacons as a congregation. Make sure that we lift them up before the Lord, that God would give them wisdom, discernment, and, the, and really his knowledge and his uh, heart for serving the church as well. Uh, let's now come and be called to worship. From Romans 11, 33 through 36. Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God. 
How unsearchable are his judgments. How inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever. Please pray with me. Our Father, our God, we come to you, and we thank you, and we praise you, and we worship you, because you are the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and you have blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even as you chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before you. In love, you have predestined us for the adoption to yourselves as sons through Jesus Christ, according to your purpose and your will, to the praise of your glorious grace. And so now, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would come and be with us and remind us of all the blessings that we have in Christ Jesus, that we might sing and worship because of God's mercy and grace with a life of continuous praise and worship. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. stand together and sing.
We're going to recite our New City Catechism today, question 39. With what attitude should we pray? With love, perseverance, and gratefulness, in humble submission to God's will, knowing that for the sake of Christ, he always hears our prayers. Let's pray corporately. Loving Father, we come to you in the name of your beloved Son. Give us perseverance in prayer, even when we do not immediately see answers. Let us believe that you will keep, keep back any good thing from us and trust that you will withhold those things we seek that would harm us. Your ways are higher than our ways, and we entrust our request to your sovereign kindness. Amen.
after confessing how great God is, we easy for us to be aware that we are not <laughs> and that we sin against him. And so we now come to corporate um, confession of sin. God, there is not a moment or thought that passes without your knowledge of it. We confess that although you are worthy of all our praise, we instead glorify other things and people, including ourselves. We confess that although you tell us to pray without ceasing, we forget to pray and instead grow anxious when we turn to other sources for help. We confess that although your word says to always give thanks, we feel entitled and disappointed when things don't go our way, even growing resentful of you. God, you know all these sins as well as others we have done, and we need your forgiveness. Amen. Please stand with us if you're able. Just a reminder, it's a time if, uh, for offering, and you can, if you fill this out, you can put it in the offering plate as a uh, bag as it goes by, and uh, let us know different ways you can serve or different ways that you want to receive communication as well. Please pray with me. Father, we come to this point of worship. It's an act of worship in which we give back to you what you have so graciously given to us, that if we are true and honest with ourselves. All that we have comes from your gracious hands. All the blessings we have come from you. 
And so, Father, we desire to worship you in spirit and in truth through giving of our tithes and our offerings for your glory and for your kingdom and for the work of your church and to reach not only Colorado Springs, but reach the West and the world. And so, Father, we come now as we give. May we give with a cheerful heart that is filled because of the joy that you have given us in all the blessings that we have in Christ Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen.
Please remain standing for the reading of God's Word. We're reading from uh, John chapter 8, 48 through 59, found in the Pew Bible at uh, page 895. The Jews answered him, Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my Father, and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, and as did the prophets. Yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who died and the prophets died? Who do, you, who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say, He is our God. But you have not known Him. I know Him. If I were to say it, I did not know Him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know Him and keep His word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, you are, yet not, you are not yet 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. This is God's word. Let us pray. Father, what an incredible statement on the part of Jesus that he is the great I am. And because he's the great I am, we have our, our hope and our security and the anchor of our faith is set on that. Father, I do pray for Chris even now as he comes to preach your word that we would not only be hearers of the word, but we would allow the word to have the impact on us that it would really have a harvest, a multitude of a harvest in our lives. Not for our sake, not for our glory, but for your glory. And because of your grace and mercy shown to us through Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we do pray. Amen. Good morning. You know, it seems that over the last few years, uh, while our culture has uh, gotten maybe a little worse at some things, it's gotten better at one thing, and that is the art of the insult. Uh, now, uh, not only do we have more creative ways uh, to actually discourage you and hurt you, but we can do it in every medium uh, you can imagine. We can do it in print, we can do it verbally, we can do it online. And you know what's amazing? Uh, with all of that increase of venom uh, that gets spit out and invective as people are unkind to one another, you know what we haven't gotten better at? Taking an insult. Have you noticed that? It's like there are a lot more of them out there, but it still hurts just as bad if someone insults you or worse yet, someone you love, maybe a spouse, a friend, a child, a parent, or even someone you just root for. You know, if someone, you know, lays down a really negative statement about the Broncos, it might hurt your heart. You might not, you might have to call in sick to work tomorrow. I don't know how that works. Uh, the reality is we live in a world that's full of this kind of thing, and yet it's very difficult to take. It, it still hurts very deeply. It's fascinating as we come to the end of John chapter 8 uh, that here we see really an extraordinary insult directed right at Jesus, and this passage ends with them attempting an impromptu execution. These are people who are not happy with Jesus. And I want us to look at that under three headings this morning as we look at these verses. Uh, one, I want to look at the one who is great in grace and in glory. Secondly, I want us to look at the one who is greater than even the greatest. And lastly, I want us to look at the greatest, full stop. 
Let's look at that as we look at this text. First of all, I want us to look at the one who is great in grace and in glory. I say in grace uh, because Jesus here, in this insult that is given to him, he is called a Samaritan. Now, for many of us, we might be like, well, I want to be a good Samaritan. And perhaps that insult doesn't really land in the way that it would have in the day. Uh, no, a Samaritan, by calling him a Samaritan, they're using an ethnic slur that is essentially equivalent to a heretic. And, uh, and while we may call each other heretics on the uh, sort of uh, evangelical Christian blogosphere, uh, you didn't call people that in public in the first century. As a matter of fact, all personal insults were considered kind of off the page, something that you would not have done in polite society. So for this to have been delivered, for him to have been called a heretic and more than that, to have it suggested that his words and his teaching and his works are the product of demonic possession, this is really a double invective. This is a significant slander against Jesus. And so how would you respond to that? I don't know what the worst name you could be called uh, would be. Uh, double, stink face, lying, good for nothing. I, I don't know. Maybe that's what it, I, I'm sorry, I'm trying to keep it G-ish. You know, uh, you know maybe, uh, you know, you'd be called like I was called as a child, uh, which will distract you the rest of the sermon, elephant ears, uh, you know, and maybe you remember that 50 some odd years later. Uh, that people used to call you that. I don't know what it is for you. But most of us would probably respond the way I would have responded and the way I did, unfortunately, in my sin, respond to insult as a youth. And that is that I responded not only with a cutting tongue, but usually a swinging hand. You know, in other words, in South Carolina, you know, if you insulted me or my mother or my football team, it was on. And I know that's not right. I'm not endorsing it. For those of you who are youth still, do not respond that way. Be forgiving and gracious. I was just a little pagan, and I responded the way my emotions wanted to respond. But that's not how Jesus responds. Do you notice how Jesus responds? He actually refutes the claim that in any way he's uh, possessed by a demon. But in so doing, he does something that is incredible for one who has just been insulted that much. Verse 51, he gives one of these incredibly true statements. He begins it with this expression. He has two of them in this passage. Truly, truly. In other words, that's Jesus' way of saying, listen up. This is important. You might want to write this down. And what does he say to these people who just insulted him? Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. After the insult, Jesus offers eternal life to those that would believe in him and keep his word. He does not slander them back, but offers them salvation in and through himself. What a tremendous thing. It is no wonder to us, if we know Jesus' teaching, uh, that he says that we are in revi when we are reviled, we should not return in kind, but we should pray for those who revile us. We should seek to do them good. And so he's modeling this here in this particular instance, which is an encouragement to me that through Christ and his power, even when the world insults me, or my family, or my faith, or, you know, anything else that I believe that I can respond by continuing to hold out Jesus Christ as he continued to hold himself out as an offer of grace to anyone who would believe and keep his word. But as we look at this dialogue, we also see an interesting thing about glory. Notice what Jesus says. He says, uh, I do not have a demon, verse 49, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. In other words, that was a dishonoring comment, even though I'm seeking to reflect the glory of God in my life. And yet in verse 15, he says, I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, 
and he is the judge. Later in uh, verse 55, he says, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. Here Jesus really gets to the heart of what so often makes us as human beings prone to uh, give back insult for insult to give evil for evil, is that it strikes at our own glory. Now, you say, wait a second, what what do you mean it strikes at our own glory? Well, our glory is our reputation. It is uh, the way we want people to think of us. Our glory, oftentimes, is that uh, thing that we hope is true of us and that other people will recognize. And when someone insults us, They're striking at that glory, and that creates a great offense. Perhaps it would be better understood if we understood it that people are striking at our pride. But our pride is just another way of saying our glory. And I love it. Jesus is able to respond in grace because he's not worried about his glory because he knows that it's being taken care of by his Father. Notice the progression uh, that he has in this passage. First of all, he knows that because he knows God himself. Uh, I love it uh, that uh, in verse 55, he says, I, uh, but you have not known him, referring to the Father. I know him, and if I were to say that I did not know him, I would be a liar like you, but I do know him. And keep his word. In other words, Jesus is saying, Look, the reason I'm not worried about my glory is I really know my Father. Later, he talks about the reality that his Father is the person you call God. And he says, I know him. I know him. And that's the first step, isn't it? For us to be free from that sort of uh, reflexive reaction to respond uh, just as people uh, speak to us or to give as good as we get, as the old expression is. The first is, do we know Jesus? That's the first step. Jesus says the first step of understanding that I don't have to worry about my glory is that I know my Father. Do we know Jesus? Do we know who he is? Do we know that he is, as we will see later in this text so beautifully, God in the flesh who has lived a perfect life, who has offered himself in our place so that we can have a relationship with God through his death and resurrection? Do we know him? Do we know he loves us? Do we know he will never forsake us? Do we know that he's with us? Because you have to know that to be free from your own glory. But there's another step. He says that he keeps his father's word. Now, he has said this earlier in chapter 8. We looked at it actually last week uh, when Jesus told them uh, that if you keep his word that you will know the truth and the truth will set you free and it is an amazing thing that so often we pull that out of its context and we just make truth to be whatever truth we prefer at the moment not realizing that Jesus is saying the only truth that will set you free is the truth about Jesus the truth about him that's the truth that will set you free here he says If you want to have that promise that I offer, you have to follow me in that I keep my Father's word. You have to keep my word. And we looked at this last week, so I'll say it very quickly. To keep means to know it, to continue to study it, to meditate on it, to actually bring it in and believe it. And to continue to walk in faith as you see his word lived out in your life day by day. We have to keep the word of Jesus. But then it leads to glory. You see, Jesus isn't worried about a temporary diminishment of his glory in the court of the women in the temple in Jerusalem at that particular moment. Because he knows that moment's not the whole of his existence and life. He has existence 
before and he has existence after. And in both, God made sure that Jesus received all the glory that is due him. He's not nervous about it. He knows God keeps his promises. And I love that because then he tells us that we can step into that glory by never seeing death. Now, that may be a, a little bit obtuse. How, how is not seeing death, how is that going to lead to my glory? If I know Jesus, I keep his word, how can I think of not seeing death as my glory? Well, let me, let me give it in phases. Jesus is most glorified by his Father in the most extraordinary way. He's most glorified by his Father when he is on a cross of execution, when he has nails through his hands and feet and a crown of thorns on his brow. It is there that God glorifies Jesus Christ because there we see the infinite expanse of God's love and grace to those who would believe in Him. In Jesus, offered completely and fully, we see the glory of God that He is perfectly just and perfectly gracious. In that, we see His glory. It is shown as His glory in the fact that He raises from the dead on the third day. And not that many days later, He ascends to heaven where He sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. This is the glory of Jesus. And here's the beauty. It is through that glorification of Jesus that God accomplishes in His perfect will that we get the glory of never seeing death. Now, this obviously troubled those that were listening to Jesus uh, because they heard Him saying that uh, people would not cease this physical existence in this temporal sphere. In other words, that they wouldn't eventually get sick and or die from some other cause. And Jesus is saying more than that. And he's saying something that we understand the glory of it and the certainty of it can encourage us to endure even the insults and hardships of this world. It is that even though this physical body may die, that in the very next conscious moment, I am alive in a way that I have never known, nor will ever get to the bottom of its greatness and glory. What Jesus is saying is that when you believe in him, when you keep his word, that death is a very fast transition from this world of woe to an eternity of glory and peace and presence with God and all joy. What Jesus is saying is your glory lies ahead of you. Just like in Jesus' earthly ministry, he knew that God had promised a glory ahead of him through his death, resurrection, and ascension. He tells the people that he's speaking to, if you will believe in me and keep my word, you will experience you will experience a glory like you cannot imagine. Now, why is this helpful to us? You say, Chris, I am kind of an in-the-now kind of guy or girl or child. And uh, you say, I'm kind of live in the moment. How is this future glory helpful to me now? It helps us put things in perspective. It helps us put things in perspective. Now, I don't know about you, but... Over the last couple years, and I apologize for my voice, I, I was around too many blooming flowers over the last couple days. Obviously not here. And uh, it has gotten into my system. And, you know, the thing that, you know, we are, uh, have become increasingly sensitive to, not only insults, but is the price of things going up. Now, I don't know about you, but every time, and I, I am an eating out kind of person, I love to eat out with my wife, it's great fun, we get to talk and enjoy each other, and it's super, what I don't like is when they bring the little black folder and set it down in front of me, and the nicer the black folder, the more nervous I get, right, 
And it seems like some of the places that were my, we could go two or three times a week kind of places, now cost like an anniversary kind of place. And, uh, and I get the check, I'm, I'm sure it hasn't happened to any of y'all, uh, I get the check and, and it, it wounds me. I mean, it wounds me. I don't know about you, but that's the way I feel. I, I know I, I have the money for it, it just wounds me to spend it on something that is already gone. It's like... Maybe they should give me the bill before I eat, and I can enjoy the food all the more, but instead they give it to you after you eat, and it, and it hurts me. But what if, you know, I get that check, and for Karen and I to have a slice of pizza and a, and, and a nice tea, it costs $50. I don't know why. And, and, and what if I knew, as I was signing my name at the bottom of the check, what if I knew that in maybe a year, or five years, or ten years, I, somebody was going to give me a hundred million dollars? What if I knew that I was to inherit a massive fortune? How would that change the way I think about the fifty dollars? Now, I have known, and some of you uh, probably are in this boat, I have known people with a hundred million dollars, and it still hurts them, I mean, it does. I've never met anybody with lots of money that loved paying money for anything. It, I don't know, maybe those two things go together. Uh, not all the time, but sometimes. But I do know that in your rational moments, you would know that the 50 bucks is a drop in the bucket compared to 100 million. You just wouldn't think too much about it. it. You'd get perspective in a hurry. You might feel it initially, but then you would write yourself. Jesus is saying, look, no matter what this world brings into your life, no matter what adversity, no matter what challenge, no matter what insult, no matter what exclusion that you experience in this life, it is nothing in comparison to the eternal life that I am offering if you know me and you keep my word. Because you will experience a joy beyond measure a peace that will never end, a health that cannot be attacked, a life that is indomitable. And you will experience it if you believe in me. When we know Jesus and we know he loves us and we are living that out through a meditation and keeping of his word, then we can know in that moment, while it may sting when someone insults us or reviles us, we can know it is simply a minor and temporary inconvenience. And that enables me to return love for hate. It enables me to pray when there's an insult. It enables me to endure and continuing to love and serve those who despise me. And it enables me to have hope when the worst of this life attacks me. Because I know there is a future glory. It is impossible when we talk about this to not mention, you know, C.S. Lewis's uh, great comment that every single day we are walking by people who are bound for glory. Either uh, an amazing, uh, horrible thing that if you met in the streets you would be terrified uh, to death, or one that is so glorious, so bright, so effusent that you would be tempted to bow down and worship them. He says there are no ordinary people. And that's right. And people who know Jesus and keep his word are heading to eternal glory and that gives us perspective secondly though and we need to move on he is greater than the greatest this immediately uh, leads uh, those that are listening to Jesus to ask a question he's talking about eternal life and he's like look the greatest sort of the hall of fame uh, in the Jewish world, they all died. And here they refer specifically to Abraham and to the prophets. And he says, look, they died. Are you greater than them? And, and, I, and I love it. Uh, it is an amazing statement. Uh, what does Jesus say in verse 56? He says, your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it. 
and was glad. And I think we can say by implication, the prophets also saw his day and saw it and were glad. First of all, let's talk about what does he mean by my day? Now, in the Old Testament, the day of the Lord is something that sort of pushes together something that we usually keep separate because we're on this side of Jesus' life, ministry, and teaching. Uh, But they thought of it as God would come, the Messiah would come, judgment would happen, the world would end, the end. And when Jesus comes, obviously he introduces us to the the shocking truth that those those are actually separated by quite a distance, that the Messiah will come that he will set things right, that he will establish his kingdom, and then at some point in the future, there will be judgment and the making of all things new. And so here, when Jesus says, they saw my day, he is essentially, in a very self-conscious way, referring to his uh, anointing as the Messiah, God's chosen, that would come and usher in the kingdom of God. And he says, they saw my day. Now, everybody always asks, when did Abraham see that? And and I think, to be honest, that's a funny question to me. When did Abraham see it? I'll give you some suggestions. Uh, In Genesis chapter 12, in verse 3, in the promise uh, that God gave to Abram, uh, initially, he told him to leave his country And then he said, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I'll make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. There, God tells Abraham that I'm going to give you a blessing that will blow your mind. I'm going to give you a blessing that is going to change the whole world in you in someone who descends from you will come someone who will be a blessing to all the nations and we look at that and say did did abraham understand that that was referring to the messiah who had come and my answer is i i think he did and here's why if you go all the way back to the beginning of the story uh in genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 God makes a promise to a man and a woman who just sinned and rebelled against him that there would be a future deliverance for them and for the whole world. He told them that even though they had rejected his word, that the woman would bear a seed who would crush the head of the serpent. And this is poetic language that says, in other words, someone from the woman will come and will be the redeemer to set things back to the way they were before sin entered into the world. And we, and we know that they took this seriously because when Adam and Eve had their first child, Eve is so excited, she says, Behold the man! But that was not the man. As Cain ended up being the first murderer in human history. No, the man would come later. And for generations, people had been waiting for the man, the one who would come to redeem people from sin, to restore the world to the order that God had created it to have. And so did Abraham know that if someone descended from him would be a blessing to all the world? Did he know that would be the man? I I think he had a pretty good idea about it. Later in Genesis 15, God reiterates this promise In verse 5, God brought Abraham outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. And then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And Abraham believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. In other words, Abraham said, I believe your promises. I know you will do it. And so Abraham saw the day of Jesus Christ. Or perhaps it was the day in Genesis chapter 22, Um, verse 7 and 8 particularly when God told Abraham to take that promised child Isaac up to a place where he would sacrifice him because the Lord commanded him and as they're on the way and they leave their servants behind you know Isaac who's not an idiot he's like well we have the wood and we have the fire 
But where's the sacrifice? And Abraham, who without a doubt is going through the worst moment of his life, says God will provide a lamb. And he did. But did Abraham understand that that was just something that was pointing forward to the lamb that God would eventually send? I think he did. That's what Jesus is referring to. Abraham saw my day and was glad. Now, this helps us in a couple of ways. One, sometimes people grow up in the church are like, well, how in the world do all those people who lived in Old Testament times, how do they have a relationship with God? And the answer is through Jesus Christ. They believed in Jesus Christ through the signs and the promises and all of the rituals that pointed ahead to a lamb who would be sacrificed for the sin of many. They believed in Jesus, but they believed in him in all of the breadcrumbs God was leaving to, through uh, not only the sacrifices, but through the promises that he had given to his people that pointed to Jesus. And so that answers that question. Secondly, it encourages us that there's just one story that's been going on through all of human history. There is just one Redeemer of men and women, and that is the one that Abraham looked to. He is greater than even the greatest Hall of Fame Old Testament believers because He's the one they were looking to and believing in. Lastly, though, He is the greatest full stop. <clears throat> Obviously, when he says Abraham saw his day and was glad, again, his interlocutors, uh, they respond in crass literalism. They say, you're not even 50 years old. Uh, that, we have no idea why they said 50 years old. He clearly was nowhere close to 50 years old. Uh, and, and they say, you're not even 50 years old. How could you have seen Abraham? When Jesus said, Abraham saw me, uh, you know, which neither here nor there. And then Jesus responds with something that is so stunning, it uh, irks them into attempting an impromptu execution. He says, verse 58, Truly, truly, again, pay attention, write it down, underline it. I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Now, this is, this is the fourth time that we've seen an expression of I am, uh, when Jesus in John chapter 8 says, I am the light of the world, in verse 24 and 28, uh, he uses this expression, but here he does it in the starkest and clearest ways. He says, before Abraham, not I was, but I am. And we have said this before, so I'll say it fast. Uh, most likely this expression uh, came to be in the Jewish consciousness through places like Isaiah chapter 43 verse 10 where God, Yahweh, is speaking. He says, You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am. The ESV translated, I am he, but the Greek simply says that I am. Before me no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. I, I am the Lord. Uh, and over and over in Isaiah, we see this kind of expression where God identifies himself as the great uh, I am. And here Jesus is saying, before Abraham was, I am. Or perhaps he's referring uh, explicitly to Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14. Uh, when Moses says, who am I going to tell the people of Israel sent me? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. This is something that, that Jesus is, is essentially making a claim. He's making a clear and obvious statement that he is not just a good teacher, that he's not just someone who does miracles, that he's not just someone who is interesting, but he is the pre-existent one. He is who John declares at the beginning of this book. Uh, he is the Word that was with God and the Word that was God. He is the Word that took on flesh and tabern tabernacled among us. He is making this astounding claim. Uh, John Calvin uh, says that it reminds him of Hebrews chapter 13 
In verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. He is saying, I am the uniquely qualified individual to make an offer of future glory because I am the I am. Now, obviously, his listeners understood what he was saying as they attempted to kill him. And they were attempting to kill him because in Leviticus it said that the penalty for blasphemy was stoning. Now, they should have gone through a trial, but who has time for a trial when someone has just said something so extraordinarily blas uh, blasphemous that you can't stand it? It's eating you up inside. But notice God protects him as he simply passes through them. But I want us, I want us to just think about this for a second as we finish. When Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am, what is he saying? Well, number one, he is making it clear that he is not an answer to the big questions of life, like why am I here? What is my purpose? How do I find meaning? What should I work for and live for? He is not an answer to that. He is the only answer to that question. He is saying that he is the one who knows God, keeps his word, and is God in the flesh, and that there is no more important or powerful person or thing that we could look to for an assurance of our future and glory than the I am. And why do I bring that up? I know you're all sitting here on Sunday morning. You're like, duh, that's why we come to church on Sunday, because Jesus is so great okay, I will take that rebuff. I know some of you thought it. But do we actually live our lives like he's the one? Do we? See, I look at this text, and I remember that John is not writing this story for the people who were in the story. He's writing this story for the people who will read the story. He's writing it for people like me and you. And he tells us at the end of his book that he has written all these things down, even though he could have written lots of other things, so that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ and have faith in him. And so we read these texts and we say, wow, you know, what a mic drop. Before Abraham was, I am, whoa. But we never take that next step of being a little introspective and asking, do I actually live my life like Jesus is the one. I mean, I don't know about you, but I too often find myself saying, well, Jesus is pretty great. He gets me at least part way down the road, but I really need this person to get me to the end. Or Jesus is pretty great. I mean, he gives me a lot of hope for the future, but it's really the money in my bank account that will get me to the finish line. Or I, I really think Jesus is great, but, you know, I really won't feel good about life unless the election goes my way. In other words, we're constantly doing a Jesus add-on, like Jesus and, you know. It's, it's like, it, we, I don't know, we kind of act like we're at the cosmic drive through and God says, can I have your order, please? And we say, I'd like Jesus and some fries, right? Uh, because Jesus isn't quite enough. I need those fries. Well done, please, to push me over the edge. And do we say that to the I am? Do we say you almost get me there? You, you work some of the time, most of the time? Or do we say you know all and you can secure my joy and my life now and tomorrow and forever in the future? Do we actually live in the truth of who Jesus claims to be? See, I think most of us wouldn't say, well, I'm, I'm trusting in Jesus and some other religious commitment. It's we trust in Jesus and some other quasi-religious commitment. Whatever it is, fill in the blank. If I only had this, I could be truly happy. Jesus says you only need the I am. You need to know him. You need to keep his word. You need to rely upon him. And you say to me, well, how does that work itself out? How does that work itself out? 
okay, let's do a little integration work and then we're done. How do I live it out that it's just Jesus that gives me meaning and significance and purpose and it directs my life? One, I talk to him. We call it prayer. We had a confession question uh, this morning about that. I talk to him. Dear Jesus, I thank you so much for everything that you have done for me and given me and promised me. Would you help me today to do what shows that I'm keeping your word? Will you help me speak to my roommate? Or will you help me act in this class or do my work or treat my coworkers in a way that reflects that you are the center and the most important thing in my life? Will you help me? And then when I get to work, and my coworker tells me that I'm overdue on something that I didn't even know about. And I snap at them. And I'm like, well, that prayer didn't work. Does that not happen to anybody else? What do I do? I talk to Jesus again. Jesus, I know that you are full of grace and glory. And yet, without you... I am only a big ball of self-consciousness and pride. Forgive me for the way I spoke to my coworker and help me to be reconciled to them in a way that's appropriate and that brings you glory. And you say, great, two prayers a day. Call me in the morning, right? No, this goes on and on. Through our day, we keep the channel open. We continue speaking to Jesus because we know he's the one who not only shows us the way, but will give us the power to live the way as we stay connected to the vital truth and power of his spirit working in us and then when things don't go our way when that insult comes when that setback comes when that uh, doctor comes and gives us the news we did not want we pray lord jesus help me believe the truth that you are all i need and help me to walk this path that you have chosen for me in a way that reflects that I am banking on a future glory and not just the glory of the moment. Give me perspective and give me your presence and help through Christ. And we continue that process. The problem is that I find that inconvenient. And so I give up on those prayers and I just go back to self-sufficiency because that seems so much easier doesn't it? But there is no power in self-sufficiency. There is 100% power in the I am. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you that you're gracious to us. Lord, I like it like uh, one of my teachers said, it's amazing that you are the God who holds together all things in all places at all times. And yet we want to treat you like an assistant instead of like the Lord of glory. Forgive us, forgive us. We're well trained in self-sufficiency, Lord. Help us to repent and to depend on the one who is the I am, the one who can deliver us from death, the one who perfectly knows and keeps the Father's word. Oh Lord, help us to increasingly be changed as we go step by step toward that eternal glory in Jesus Christ in whose name we pray. Amen. Please rise and join in singing. Jesus Christ and the more that I behold him the more he satisfies when I gaze upon his beauty when I see him as I should then my eyes are lifted upward for his glory am I good there is hope
you to leave knowing that you're blessed so receive this blessing from God through his word may the Lord bless you and keep you may the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit amen amen you're dismissed